Aviation Tent here at Sun and Fun 2023. My name is Mindy Lindheim. I have the Schmindy social media accounts and the Chase and Tailwinds mini series brand. I fly a 1957 182 Skyline. I've owned it for about a year and a half. I use it for both business and adventuring. And joined with me today is Josh Flowers. Josh, introduce yourself and what you fly. Yeah, my name is Josh Flowers. Uh, Aviation 101 on YouTube is my handle there. Aviation 101 Films on pretty much all other socials. Uh, I, I'm very passionate about filmmaking and I've kind of used aviation as my creative outlet over the years. And uh, I fly a 1976 Cessna 172 Mike model. Uh, also use it for business and you know travel, pleasure, that kind of thing and uh, just kind of document my experiences. And uh, I guess we're gonna talk about kind of what we've done to these old airplanes over time. Yes, we both have, as you said, old airplanes. Mine is much older old. than yours. Yes. <laughs> but we both just went through a panel upgrade and a lot of people want to do that to their airplanes and it seems a little bit confusing and maybe daunting on how to go about that. We've actually had two kind of different experiences so we wanted to share with you guys how we did our panel upgrades, why we did some of those things, and if you want to get a panel upgrade, how you can do that yourself. So first of all, we both chose Garmin Aviation Equipment. I learned on a Garmin G1000 plane. I was very blessed to be able to learn on that. So Garmin was my first introduction to glass. That's what I've always been comfortable with. I've always been really happy with that. Um, so that's why I went with Garmin. So why, why did you pick Garmin? Very similar kind of situation, except I did not learn on a G1000. <laughs> I learned on a 152 with a six pack and actually no GPS. Uh, but as I, I progressed through my training, my dad and I got a hold of this 172. My dad's a pilot as well. He's the one that got me into it. Uh, so we got this airplane and we found a used 430 and we put it in there. Neither of us had experience with a Garmin 430. But over time, we, we just kind of learned the buttonology and it became second nature. Like, you, you know, you get to a point with your avionics where you can, you can load an approach in your sleep, you know? So that's how I felt about the Garmin 430. I had used a G1000 a little bit and I found it so easy to translate the buttonology and, and kind of the muscle memory of loading things in the avionics. It's the exact same on a G1000. So we wanted to keep that same kind of theme and roll into the avionics that we have now, ultimately. Yeah, that is the nice thing about Garmin is whether you fly a 430 or a 650 or a G1000, the brains behind it is all the same. So you can easily get into another cockpit and learn that new equipment equipment like very quickly. Uh, how long did it take for you to learn Garmin equipment being new to glass? I, it, so I guess the first, uh, the first introduction I had to Garmin stuff was the 430. The buttonology is very similar once we moved to glass. So we, it was kind of a slow transition because we started with just a traditional six pack. And as we moved through the years, we upgraded the airplane to Garmin G5s and we put an engine monitor in, got rid of all the gauges and everything. So that was kind of an easy transition. We started with the G5s and that's a very tight package, made your scan very easy. And then going from that to the Garmin G3X that we have now, it's basically a bigger G5 with a whole lot more features. So I found the transition super easy. And then on the, the actual navigator side, going from a 430 to a 750, like you said, it's the same brain, same logic. It's just a little bit different buttons. Now you're tapping a screen instead of buttons, but it all does the same stuff. Same amount of button presses or keystrokes, same logic, and it's so easy. Yeah, I, I agree. And they have a lot of good training stuff out there. There's a ton of YouTube videos uh, on your channel even that you can learn a lot. So there's a lot of Garmin product out there to learn from already. But um, so the panel upgrade in general, why go through the hassle? I went through the hassle because our plane was a stock 1957 and it was beautiful. And so our goal when we did the panel upgrade was to not destroy that vintage appeal. We wanted to be safe and we wanted to fly IFR, but we wanted to keep that vintage charm. and. Like I said, we did the panel upgrade just to start with because we wanted to travel more. And at that point, we were VFR only in our plane. And we run some tight schedules, me and my husband. So when we want to go somewhere, we want to have the ability to shoot an approach. And so that's kind of what drove this panel upgrade was, if we do this, we're going to get to use our airplane so much more. Right. 
rather than it being a hanger queen. So that's why we did it. Why did you go through all this? Very, very similar reason. You said you wanted to preserve the vintage charm. We absolutely destroyed the <laughs> 1970s look of this panel. Uh, it made it completely look like a modern airplane on the inside. And you can see some pictures cycling through of both of our instrument panels. That's actually in the middle of the upgrade at the shop on ours. Kind of hard to see in the bright light. And that's what it looks like now. So we, the 1976 model of the 172 was one of the first years that they actually put a, a a six pack as we know it these days in the airplane. Before it was kind of offset a little bit, engine instruments were on the right side of the panel. This is the first year that they put them on the left side of the panel. So it was already a layout that I really liked and it was really friendly with the G5s. I use the airplane for a ton of IFR traveling um, I, and I film flights, I film kind of quasi instructional stuff, try to not make it official instruction, but yeah. I, I try to be educational with my videos and I, I just show off the beauty of these trips. And I wanted something that was going to be a capable platform. I probably had about 1,500 hours of hand-flying long trips in that airplane oh my under my belt. So I was like, okay, <laughs> autopilot should be the next step. And then we, we just kind of went down a rabbit hole and we decided to just go all out with the Garmin G3X. So my dad got me into flying early on, kind of a backstory. We found this airplane after I became a pilot. He got current. Now we're two pilots. We're like, we need an airplane. We found this old Skyhawk that needed a paint job, needed an interior, needed a panel. Uh, it was, we knew it was going to be a father-son project. And over the years, now 10 years later, uh, this is what the airplane looks like. We've done paint, interior, panel, everything, new engine. Wow. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been a real journey. And that's ultimately the reason that we decided to put all of this into this Cessna 172. The dual G3X is, a, is like complete overkill, in my I opinion. I love it. It's totally sufficient on one screen, 750, even a 650, you know. but. We're never going to get rid of this airplane. And, and for me, this is always going to be the airplane that I got to share with my dad. It was our father-son project. It's such an easy airplane to maintain, fly. Yeah. It's a pleasure to fly. We're not getting rid of it. So let's right. make it what we want. So after you decided, OK, I want to do this panel, and I know I want Garmin, how did you choose the shop that you went to? That's a big question I get all the time, is how do you find a good shop to do the installation? That's that. It's kind of an interesting thing too. It kind of fell into my lap at that point. So we have several avionics shops that were local to us in Central Texas. But my buddy Cameron is good friends with the director of maintenance at the one here in Daytona, uh, Daytona Beach, Daytona Aircraft Services, and his name's Jake, director of maintenance, great guy. Uh, he, basically, he loves a good project, and because we had a mutual friend, we started texting back and forth about it. And he basically said, "Okay, what are you putting in the panel?" And I kind of had a rough idea, and he said, "Okay." And like the next day, he sent me a PDF, and he was like, this is what we're going to do. Like, he, he just already had it laid out So and you had no input. He's like, this is your panel. Not, not, not very much. <laughs> uh, once we got there and we started the process, we tweaked a couple little things, but he was like, this is going to be the main layout. And this is, we're going to take a saw, we're going to cut this structure out, we're going to redo this, and it, they're an FAA repair station, so they just went all out yeah. and cut everything out, and we, we gutted the whole plane. I know. I've seen some of the photos that are going up here yeah. on the project right now that you were completely torn apart. So did you take that photo yourself? I did take that photo myself. So I, I wanted to film the series, and I wanted to cover what the process looks like of, of just totally gutting an airplane and redoing all the electrics uh, in, in the middle of an avionics project. So I stayed in Daytona Beach for two months oh my gosh. <laughs> while they worked on the vacation. airplane. And I, I, that's I, how you pick a shop, is based on location. That's right. right? <laughs> well, yeah, Daytona Beach wasn't a bad place to stay anyways. Um, but I, I stayed there the whole time, and I, I sat over the, the designer's shoulder as he went through CAD. Of course, I was filming it, and we would tweak little things like, let's move these switches here, and we, uh, in the Skyhawk on the lower panel under the yoke, that's where the, the electrical and switches and breakers normally were. I hated that location, so we actually moved it up where the old engine instruments were, in plain view, easy yeah. to reach now. It's, just, it's a lot more modern. It okay. looks like a modern Skyhawk in there now. Um, so I had a pretty heavy hand in tweaking things, but the overall design was like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to do it this way. Hey, they it's going to look great. they know what they're doing. You can trust them, and it turned out great. So that's good. So you pick your shop based on a mutual friend that yeah. used them before. That seems to be kind of a common theme. It's finding a good recommendation. So I use Gardner Lowe Aviation. They were uh, luckily in close proximity to where I lived at the time, so that was amazing. But I got to watch them pretty much in my own backyard do all these insane panel upgrades on other aircraft. I was getting some oil changes and annuals done with them previously for some other of my work aircraft. So I would go in there and see them doing these whole custom panels. And I really wanted to do something fully custom. I wanted something unique. 
and I needed a shop that I could trust could do that vintage charm and like who, who got it that wasn't going to go against what I wanted that would listen to me and be like yes we understand and here's our recommendation to keep the vintage and add glass so they did that exactly um, Carl Gardner he was really really great with that he knew that the vintage thing was really important to me so I brought the plane over to him for the first time and we talked about it months before this ever even happened um, and brainstormed like all the parts of our panel that we wanted to make sure we kept like I have a really cool glove box with the old Cessna logo I'm like I have to have that but it was in a place on the panel that was going to be removed and he was really quick to say no problem we can move the glove box and keep it so that's what they did so they were really great about being able to customize what we wanted to do so that was really important for us um, when I first engaged with Carl and Gardner Lowe to start designing the panel, which we're going to talk about in a second because I want to know how your shop designed yours. Mm -hmm. I sent them, I was on the road, so I sent them from my phone. I took a screenshot of my own panel and just with the iPhone little features, I highlighted areas like this is where I want the six pack to be, this is where I want an iPad, this is where I want the glove box. And, this janky little photo that you'll see come up and then the one that was just up was their first iteration they instantly sent me back a pdf like does this look good and then we tweaked it back and forth until we found the perfect layout for uh, me yeah. uh, there was, was it up there yeah, for a it, was second? Up there. It, was, it was up there <laughs> yes it's the silliest photo i love sharing that because that's how easy it can be it doesn't have to be difficult just send them your ideas and let them go to town with it and something that was important for me is me and my husband are both pilots and we both fly the airplane and sometimes I fly from right seat sometimes I fly from left seat it, it's not always the same seat or the same pilot so what we wanted was something that was accessible by either the left or right seat every piece of equipment you're able to see clearly and touch every button no matter what seat you're in that way you know something you know where to happen or whatever we want to switch off someone's tired and hey you have flight controls it can be fully transferred to either seat so that was important to us instead of keeping everything traditionally really stacked heavy on the left seat um, so ours is kind of all towards the center instead yeah. so that's what we went with so how about you is how is your panel laid out symmetry was the biggest deal to me um, and, and when we figured out that we're gonna go with two 10 inch screens first of all I was like how are we gonna fit that yes because that was also a problem <laughs> the, the avionics stack is actually it's cheated to the right a little bit to make room for all the instruments that are traditionally on the left so what they actually did is they took a saw they cut the, the avionics rack out and it looked like Swiss cheese anyways from all the <laughs> upgrades since 1976 and, uh, and they, they built an entirely new structure with the avionics stack centered directly over the throttle, which is dead center of the panel. So the avionics stack is now dead center, and both G3X screens are perfectly centered over both yokes. I like so that. So that way, because it's, yes. it's my dad and I flying that airplane, kind of the same, same situation. It's two yeah. pilots. Yeah. Sometimes I'm from the right seat. Sometimes I'm in the left, and he's in the right. You know, a lot of times when we fly together, he's in the left seat. So I wanted to have a, two sets of of uh, basically full instrument panels, one in front of each seat, and on the G3X you can customize what the split screen looks like on the MFD, on the, on the right side. Uh, on the pilot side, the STC says one side at least has to be the PFD, so yeah. I, I made the right side the same, so it's also a PFD over there when you go split screen, so it doesn't matter if he's shooting an approach from either seat, I'm shooting an approach from either seat, we have a full set of instruments and navigation tools right there in front of us, whichever seat you're sitting in. It's yes. just on the touch screen right there. I think that's so important. Yeah. It's, yeah, if you have two pilots in your family. Right. So um, symmetry, reachability, ease of use, that was just all what I wanted. So now all of our breakers are, are underneath the yoke, all the switches are on the left underneath the backup G5, and everything else is just perfectly centered and it's nice and even. So we have both kind of mentioned a little bit of equipment we have, so quickly run through your equipment and then tell me what is your favorite part of your panel or your favorite piece of equipment and why? Okay, that, that's, that's very easy to answer. Okay. Um, and I'll get to the favorite part here in a second. That's the easy part. Um, I got to remember everything that's in there because uh, there, there are a lot of remote mounted parts that you don't see and directly right. inter inter interact with. But we have the dual G3X, both, both are 10 inch screens. Uh, we have the G5, which was originally in the airplane. We kept one of them as a backup. 
We put a Guardian CO detector that interfaces with the G3X in there. We have Garmin Smart Glide. Uh, so oh, the really? Button. We have Smart Glide because we have the 750 TX, uh, or the 750XI. Uh -huh. um, and then below that, we have a Garmin Navcom Garmin GTX 345 transponder with ADS-B in and out that will actually talk to our iPad, which I'll get to that in a second. And then below that is the GFC 500, which is hands down my favorite piece of equipment in that airplane. Yeah. It's two axis autopilot, fully coupled with everything, VNAV, you know, cross Baron at maintain 5000, put it in the flight plan, hit VNAV and you're good to go. It's just gonna fly the vertical profile, fly the approach. On these long 12, 14 hour days that is required if you wanna get somewhere in a Skyhawk, the autopilot is amazing at reducing fatigue. And that's exactly what I use the airplane for. So that's Autopilot's definitely my favorite place. Autopilot <laughs> is the best. Yeah. I also have the same autopilot as you, but my first autopilot was named Kevin, which is my husband. <laughs> uh, but he got yeah. tired of that, so we put a real one in. <laughs> I, I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a much different panel than you, like I said, trying to keep that vintage charm. So I wanted to keep the six pack look and you'll see that come up on the screen every once in a while. So on the left side, we have kind of that traditional six pack looking panel. And I have three of the old round dials that I kept and then three of the GI 275s. One is for the attitude indicator. The one underneath is an HSI. And then the one on the right is the EIS. So that's the engine monitor. So there's three different 275s you can get. So I got all three of those in nice view for either seat. And then to the right of that is kind of like the main stack of the moving map and everything, which is the Garmin 650XI with flight stream. And then I have an iPad to the right that I have um, not panel mounted, but I have one of the RAM mounts that keep it up and nice on display. So I can Bluetooth my flight plan right to the Garmin 650, which I love doing that. Just clicking one button over is awesome. I have the G500 autopilot, which is really fantastic. You already described why it's so great. Um, a new Bluetooth audio panel so you can play music and everything through that on your long cross countries. Yep. The new uh, 345 transponder that you also have with ADS-B in and out that talks to my iPad. And then one of those hidden ones that you talked about that you kind of don't think about all the time is I have the GDL 52 which talks to my iPad that I have on the panel and shows me Sirius XM weather, and you can also listen to the radio through that as well. Airplanes. So, yes, lots and lots of equipment all buried in there. So we kind of ran out of space as well. That was kind of the tricky part, and that's why we had to move our glove box. So I guess point being of all that is get creative with your shop and tell them this is my must-haves, and let's let them design it if you're not feeling creative. Um, they, I'm sure they've seen whatever you're going through. But um, to get to the end of the process, so you pick out the equipment, you design it, you send it to the shop, you show up and it feels like you're picking up a brand new airplane, but then there's like one more step to completing this whole process, which is pickup day. So tell me about your pickup day, your mentality on that very first flight and what you did with that first flight when you picked up. I, I guess I could just call it test flight day. It wasn't really yeah. pickup day because I was there the whole time. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was kind of watching it all come together, but uh, the initial test flight was very exciting and, and kind of nerve wracking. And I was admittedly a little bit lost. Uh, I won't even say a little bit. I was quite lost in this panel. It was pretty wild. Um, luckily at Daytona Aircraft Services, through, through my mutual friend and, and I know the director of maintenance and stuff, they have their, their demo airplane there, which is an RV7A that's just souped up out the gills and it has the exact same panel that went into the Skyhawk. So I went up with a test pilot and flight instructor that is super experienced in that airplane and he allowed me to shoot some approaches and figure out the G3X before getting into the Skyhawk. So that helped me get a little bit of a leg up there, but I went on the initial test flight, of course there was you know, maybe five squawks that needed to be addressed, just little things that need to be tweaked. A couple of pins on the audio panel were not right. They were acting a little bit weird, so we fixed that stuff. But it was really like, it was pretty unreal. And I think at this point I had already kind of gotten over it because I, I literally watched them yeah, rip this thing apart. you saw it all, you cheated. I did cheat, I saw, I saw the whole thing happen. But uh, I guess the, the real overwhelming feeling came right at the beginning when I saw the entire panel come out Bundles of cables were getting snipped, and it, like it's like we passed the point of no return. And this airplane That's that I scary. am so fondly familiar with 
I was like, what have we done? Yeah. <laughs> this is never going back together the same way yeah. if we decide to turn around for some reason. Um, but of course, you know, they are absolute artists. They are engineers. They did a fantastic job with this. And one thing I really admired, and, and I listened to them very, very, uh, very thoroughly on this, because I had my, my little things that I wanted tweaked on the airplane, but you know, somebody may come in with a design on, on what you want with a, with a panel, but what a lot of pilots that aren't involved with maintenance don't understand is there are structures, there are components, there is equipment yeah. behind your panel that will quite literally prevent something from going in this blank spot on the panel because there's a structure back there, because there's a tapered, you know, this or that, or there's the, the you know, some dimmer box for something or whatever. So we worked very heavily through all of that stuff. Seeing it all come together was like, it was like seeing the unveiling of, of a painting yeah. that has taken a year, you know, or something like that. It was, uh, it was really exciting. And then after we worked out the squawks, like to this day, I'm still like, I can't believe this is the same 172. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah, it felt like I was buying my plane all over again. And the way, like the excitement that I had when my plane first showed up when I bought it, it was kind of the same, if not even greater, picking it up from the shop, seeing it, like all of our hard work, everything that we envisioned. So when I showed up to the shop, this is exactly what I saw. This is a replica of the custom panel that Gardner Lowe did for us. So we did some custom engraving on it. We named our plane Mojo. We're pretty committed to it now uh, <laughs> because it's engraved on my panel. <laughs> um, we have those power plugs that we added in as well. So those are outlined here. This on my plane is where I have my RAM mount for my iPad. So this is just some extra decor on our replica. But here we have a blank space on ours above the second yoke here where we have our iPad that connects to the Sirius XM and to our transponder and everything like that. And here is where the 650 audio panel and the autopilot lives. And then the 275s on the far side. So when I got there, I was like, this is incredible. A uh, really cool thing about Gardner Lowe is my first flight, they sent me up with one of their avionics techs who knew the equipment really well because same as you, I don't know half of this stuff. I haven't flown with right. any of this stuff before, which turned out to be really easy, but it was nice to go up with a tech that knew what they were looking for. Um, and he had his own checklist. Okay, we're going to take off from the airport. We're going to stay local. We're going to test the autopilot. We're going to test the 275s, check all the heading bugs. We're going to shoot an approach. We're going to go missed. I have a go around button now in my 1957 <laughs> plane, which is yeah. wild. So we tried that out and it was just nice, and like you said, just to set expectations with everyone, it's, it may not be 100% perfect when you take that first flight, and that's why you do that. That's why your first flight shouldn't be from the shop going home. Your first flight should be a local flight to test everything out because it may need a little bit of tweaking. For example, I realized quickly on my 275 that my old 50s fuel senders don't talk to it very well. They weren't working right. So then I upgraded to the Sice fuel senders, which are awesome, and upgraded those to talk to my 275. So you find stuff out like that. So just, you know, expect to have a few things. And that's totally fine. It's a part of the process. And then I flew it home after all that. And it's just fantastic. We're so happy with it. We've started to fly at IFR. We're shooting approaches in this old airplane that has. I don't know if there's any airline people in here, but this plane, is, this panel does more than airline planes do. So does yours. Like, yeah. it's just wild what this new equipment can do. And uh, I guess just to wrap this all up is if you had any advice to someone who's thinking about upgrading their panel, what advice would you give them? Or like, kind of what's that first step? Because it just sounds like a lot. The first step is for sure figure out your mission. What kind of flying are you going to be doing primarily? And what kind of airplane is it going into? Real panel real estate is obviously very different from y'all's 182 to the 172. Yeah. It's, so figure out how much room you have to work with and what's your mission? What kind of avionics do you want? And right down to personal preference, do you want to absolutely destroy the vintage feel and go with big t <laughs> square touch screens? Or do you destroy want- Destroy is a harsh word. Right. Or do you want to, uh, do you want to go with something like GI 275s to go in the, the original round holes where the instruments would go and stuff. So the fir first step is just like with buying an airplane to begin with, what's your mission? What kind of airplane are you looking for? What kind of avionics are going to suit your mission? Are you primarily flying VFR, sightseeing, 
do you need to shoot IFR, you know, instrument right. approaches? Are you doing SIDs and STARS? Uh, lots of things to consider there. So what is your mission? That would be my, my advice for the first step. Yeah, and I guess my last piece of advice would be once you figure that out, go to the shop that you think that you want to work with. Maybe that's someone that was recommended to you. Social media is an amazing thing now. Gardner Lowe is awesome on Instagram. They post all their before and after photos, which is really cool. So find a shop that kind of fits your vibe and seems helpful. Give them a call and start talking about it. And something else to think about is we totally understand the price tag on this stuff is a lot. So what you can do is do it in phases. Mm -hmm. And if you know you're going to have the plane for a long time, like Josh or myself, I plan on keeping this plane a very long time, you can design the panel with the shop from the start and tell them this, like, hey, this is my budget now, but this is my end goal. And they can design a panel where that you can do these upgrades in phases. It's definitely best if you can swing it to do it all at once, but I know it's not feasible all the time, and, and they do too. So they would be willing to work with you to say, hey, here's phase one and phase two we're going to do two years from now or something like that. So just something to think about uh, to work with a shop that's really good at doing custom stuff and listening to your needs and mission. So I think that about wraps it up. If anyone has any questions, we'll take any questions or we will hang around here afterwards. But thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, E3, for having us in the chalet here at Sun and Fun. And thank you, Josh, for coming up here and talking panels. Happy to be here. It's a panel panel. That's, oh, ooh, yeah, it was yeah. a panel panel. All right. <laughs> any questions from anybody? <laughs> Where does so thorough? Right. Nailed it. All right. Thank I you guess. guys. Appreciate it.